Welcome and good morning. It is uh, good to be back together, and uh, today we continue in our sermon series, Back with the Names of God, looking at our sixth sermon in this, six out of seven, so we're just about finished with this series. And uh, at this point, you should be able to remember the, uh, the main passage, Psalm 140, 13, calling us to praise the name of the Lord. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. So it's our sixth week in this series of seven, learning the 16 names of God, or Hebrew names of God, out of the 200 or so uh, that are found in Scripture. So it's my hope that learning these names helps to add to our praise and our service of God and to one another. I also hope that you're seeing that each of these names finds a fulfillment in Jesus and that we can know God in his complexity by learning some of these names. So the question is, do you know and do you share Jesus as the God of creation, a part of the God of creation, out of the plural name there? Do you know him as your Lord, the one who leads you, as uh, the Lord Jehovah, as the Lord Almighty, your sustainer, as your Adonai, the Lord who you surrender yourself to, the most high God above everyone else, every issue, every struggle in life? Do you know him as your banner, the one that you look to in the battle? Do you know God as your shepherd and your friend, the one that heals you and keeps you going, and the one that is there with you always? Do you know God in that way? Well, that's what these names reflect. We reflect that in Jesus being the Lord, our righteousness, the one who sanctifies us, sets us apart, and becomes our holiness. Not something that we create, but something that we uh, appreciate. And today we're looking at an everlasting God, a God that will provide, and then we finish off with that Jesus, that God is our peace, the Lord of hosts, he's the one that rules the army, and kind of an interesting one at the end is that our God is a jealous God. Because of the complexity of God, we can spend our whole life getting to know him in different ways. Learning these Hebrew names helps us to see a different aspect or a facet of him and maybe uh, get into something that we're not used to or a little out of our comfort zone to be able to see God in a different way and appreciate him differently. The first aspect of God that we're going to look at in the sermon today is around the eternal, timeless nature of God. See, unlike a king or a ruler or even the pagan gods that were supposed to need the prayers and offerings of the people to stay alive, our God doesn't need anything. And he has always existed and will always exist. Our God is an everlasting God, and that trait blesses us in many ways. In, it's a trait that we may take for granted, that we just assume, well, of course, if he's God, he has no beginning or end, or he will always exist. But that's not the common way of thinking of a God, especially at the time that this was written. Now, because they're Hebrew names, we're going to look at Old Testament passages. The Old Testament was written in primarily in Hebrew, the New Testament primarily in Greek. So isn't it wonderful that our God is an everlasting God? And amen to that. I have a core passage to this week. I'm trying to think of different ways that we can interact with the text and interact with the video message as well. And uh, this week I'd like to encourage this one as a memory verse. Psalm verse 90 and Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you were God. So repeat that with me. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Well, I didn't hear you. Maybe that's because this is pre-recorded. But I hope that you're getting that into your mind. Before the mountains were born, before anything existed, God is, was, and has always been. That's a powerful image. It is the core of the name El Olam the everlasting God, because that's what, again, the compound means. El is of God, and olam comes from the root word ilm, or olam, and uh, that everlasting, or long-lasting, or forever, occurs 439 times in the KGV. King James Version looking at that as the concordance for this. 
Olam means forever, eternity, everlasting. So El Olam can be translated as the eternal God, which speaks of a God who will never die. It also kind of refers to uh, the God that has always existed. So, the 439 times that Olam occurs isn't always paired with God being everlasting. Uh, but a number of these everlasting aspects also come up because they're connected to God. So, this week, in order to do a little more research for this, I read all 439 passages and looked for the ones that connected to who God is. And so here's a few of them, and then later on I'm going to point out a number of the other everlasting or long-lasting aspects that are mentioned in that. So I'm going to question you, what else is spoken of as everlasting? Can you think of that? What else would God say, here's an everlasting? Because I'm everlasting, this also is everlasting. Let's see how many of those you get right or connect to in a minute here. Our everlasting God. First passage from Genesis 21, 33. On page 31, if you're following along in the Blue Bibles, each of these will have a page number on it. It says, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. So we have Yahweh Olam El, the name of the Lord, the eternal God. It recognizes the trait of God being eternal. Again, not common to think of God as eternal, but it starts that, uh, that mentality. In Exodus 15, 18, it says, The Lord Yahweh will reign for how long? He'll reign forever and ever. In Jeremiah 10, 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the Elohim. He is the living God, the eternal king. So there's a, a hint. One of the eternals is God is an eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles, the nations cannot endure his wrath. But notice how it's referred to as he is the true God, he's a living God, he's an eternal king. The traits that we need to know. As we move along, we take a look at uh, Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 4, Trust in the Lord Yahweh forever, for the Lord Yah, the Lord Yahweh, is the rock eternal. He is the olam. Now, a few passages or a few translations talk about this as the eternal strength, and you could go either way in the translation on this. A passage that we know quite, uh, we're quite familiar with is Isaiah chapter 40, 28 through 31, and it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord, Yahweh, is the everlasting Olam, God, Elohe, the singular, the creator of the ends of the earth, he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Isn't that true? No one can fathom the understanding of God. We can't even begin to think about how much God knows and uh, how well he knows things. Do you not know? Have you not heard? He is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's not going to be tired or weary. But then how does that translate to us? Well, the part of the passage we're familiar with that we sing, and I have it as one of the songs that we can sing this week, comes up, and you see the image there. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Because the second part of the passage, starting in verse 29, says, He gives strength to the weary. This God who has no end, this God who doesn't grow weary or tired, this God whose understanding you can't even fathom, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, Yahweh, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Then I wanted to point out a few from the Psalms that are speaking about the character trait of God. From Psalm 41, verse 13, it says... Praise be to the Lord Yahweh, the God Elohe of Israel from everlasting. And then we have a compound here, Maha Al-Holam, to everlasting Ha Al-Holam. Amen and Amen. We have praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Yeah, try to remember that one this week. And Psalm 92, 8, but you, O Lord, are exalted for how long? Forever. 
Because we can praise God forever. That's how long he will last. So what did you notice in the passages? What are some of the aspects that come up? Some of the terms or, or phrases in there. How would life be different if we had a frail or temporary God? If we had a God that had such limited power or need to be recharged or was able to help at some times but isn't able to help it at other times, a God that was uh, temporary that needed to pass on his power to somebody else, that's not the God that we serve. Our God is not that kind of God. And it would really change our faith and what we can expect from God. What other traits of God might be recorded as eternal? Have you thought about that? Let's see if you come up with some of the ones that came up in the, the 439 passages that I was looking at. God's promise of an eternal. An eternal what? Well, here's some of the phrases. In these uh, Hebrew passages, there's a, a mention of an eternal covenant, kingdom, priesthood, law, king, reign, strength, salvation, an eternal love, an eternal life, an eternal mercy, an eternal kindness, joy, righteousness. Well, I might have missed a couple in there. I started taking note a little later in the reading. But all of these come because God is eternal. Each of these are connected to the eternal nature of God. Because God is eternal, he can make an eternal covenant. He can have an eternal law. He can be the eternal king. He can give us eternal salvation. His mercy will last forever. His joy and righteousness unending because of who he is. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these. Right? Each of these are connected to the eternal nature of God. Some of these aspects adjust from a physical form to a spiritual one in the New Testament. At that time was their promise. They're thinking the eternal kingdom is a kingdom of the Jews. An eternal king is going to be like David. But the fulfillment of that really is in Jesus. How many of them did you think of? Maybe you thought of some others that I didn't have on the list. But maybe take this time this take time this week to thank him for these aspects that it will never end because of who he is. So let's tie this in as we have each week to communion. Our eternal God, our El Elam, who has always existed and who will always exist, our God who has no beginning, a God who has no end, takes on flesh. But he also takes on the limits of flesh in order to provide us with salvation. As we share the bread today, I would like us to think of Jesus coming in the flesh and taking on a body. The eternal God now has flesh. The eternal God now has the limits of a body. He has the limits of hands and feet being in a single place at a single time. He has hunger, he has fear, he has frustration. And now, the eternal God has pain. Jesus lives his life as an example of living with a spiritual mindset within a physical body. He focuses on the will of the Father and how to serve him and others within the limitations of his body and within the limitations of his time frame. The body that he now has, the body that he walks the earth with, will face death. But the church body that he creates will be eternal. Aren't we thankful for the eternal nature of the church and the life of Jesus? Breaking bread together each week helps us remember the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, as well as the call to be his body to the world today. Because he is eternal and without end, God will share that nature with us as part of the body of Jesus. Let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Then you can pause the video and partake and come back to it. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly and eternal God, we thank you for the time to be in your word and to learn more about you. We thank you for your eternal nature and the power and perspective that you provide us as your followers. We thank you, Jesus, for taking on flesh and experiencing the limitations that flesh provides. We thank you for your example of surrender and service and the confidence with which you face death even death on the cross. We know that you went through so much to save us, and as we share the bread today, we are thankful for, for your body that arose from the grave. 
and the church family which you have made us a part of, it is with great thanks, sadness, and celebration that we break this bread together today, looking forward to our time with you for eternity. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Even in this way, it is good to have a communion together to share in this time of remembrance and thought about Jesus. Let's think it through a little more. Our God is an eternal God who blesses us with eternal blessings. And we have several passages that point to that truth. Our second name is only in one passage, but it's a key passage in Scripture. The Lord will provide Yahweh Yira is a name from Genesis 22:14 during that test of Abraham to offer Isaac. Pretty key passage in the Bible. Yahweh Yira, the Lord will provide, is a symbolic name given to Mount Moriah by Abraham to, memor to remember the intercession of God in the sacrifice of Isaac by providing a substitute for the imminent sacrifice of his son. Do you remember this account? Well, Let's do a quick summary of Genesis 22. Starting on page 31, if you want to start turning there. In Genesis 22, on page 31, God now calls Abraham as a test of faithfulness and commitment to take his son to the region of Moriah to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. Abraham acts in obedience and has everything set for the journey and the sacrifice. In verse 7, Isaac asks, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? The reply by Abraham is, God himself will provide the lamb. In verse 9, Isaac is bound and placed on the altar, and the angel of the Lord stops the sacrifice and commends his fear and his faithfulness. In verse 13, God does provide a ram for the sacrifice. And in verse 14, we read, So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Yira. And to this day, it it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, Yahweh, it will be provided, Yira. Following this passage, the blessing to Abraham of numerous descendants are reaffirmed and were a part of that spiritual fulfillment because of Jesus. Now this is quite the passage about the test of Abraham and binding his son and putting him on the altar and expecting, anticipating that God is going to provide a sacrifice. It is such a, a statement of faith and it's so unusual to think uh, of that type of a test of faith that you would provide your own child. But it's also this test and this faithfulness is mentioned again in, in Hebrews chapter 11. It speaks about this and it gives a little insight about the mindset of Abraham during this. In Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, the event is recorded for the Hebrew readers many years later, and we see the mindset. It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though he had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And here's the mentality part of it in verse 19. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. This is that statement of faith, that confidence that even if I take his life, God can bring him back. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This one-time passage, this one-time name as God our provider could occur all over the Bible because God is the one who does provide. This little note here, the meaning of the name Yahweh Yireh depicts God who foresees our need and makes provision in advance especially our need of his grace. By providing the ram to get caught in the thicket, God had provided in advance. And God knows what we need, and he's already able to provide if we will ask and connect to him as our provider. That one-time name about God our provider could occur all over the Bible because we know that God is the one that does provide. He loves us and cares for us because he is eternal. We can have these blessings in the here and now, and we can have the blessings 
forever. In Matthew chapter 6, we are told not to worry about our lives or tomorrow because God is the one who cares for us as he cares for the birds. So instead of worry, what are we to do? Matthew 6, instead of worry, what do you put your energy into? What do you put your mindset into? What do you focus on? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Many people are worried right now while we still focus on faithfulness and the God that provides for us even after death. See, a lot of times God provides for us in the here and now, and we ask for healing, and we are healed. We ask for protection, and we are protected. But that isn't always the way that it happens. Sometimes we ask, and we don't receive like we thought. We're asking for something physical and temporary, and we receive something that is eternal. Yahweh Yira is a rich and a full name. It is a blessing to know that the Lord will provide. Not in a health and wealth sort of way, that uh, as long as you're a Christian, everything is going to be good. That's not the promise, really. But in a sowing and reaping well way. If Abraham did this, the sowing, the reaping, the result was God stopped the sacrifice. It's also in an eternal perspective instead of an earthly one. We want to know that we're going to be okay. Well, we may die. We may suffer. We may struggle. We may face some misery, but we will be okay eternally. And that is a true promise. We can thank God that he promised to provide us with all of our needs according to the riches of the glory by Christ Jesus. Remember that? Philippians 4.19. He promises to provide all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He'll provide for you emotionally, sustaining you with energy, renewal, and encouragement. He will guide you financially, guide us socially, culturally, mentally, physically, in our education. He provides guidance in matters of communication. How do we talk? What do we talk about? In attitude, in family, in stress, in anger, anxiety, fear, frustration. And he guides us in the positive aspects of knowledge, wisdom, strength, Guidance, delivers, protection, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That list sound familiar? With all sufficient grace for every trial. God allows a sense of weakness and shortage to force us to depend on him for our every need. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, David penned a great promise in Psalm 34 about the Lord's ability to care for us. The second part of verse 10 says, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And that is true, because Jesus is our everything and he is our all. With him we have everything and we lack nothing. Even when we don't see the things that we want, even though that we're missing some of the things that we would like, even though we want some things to return that have been taken away, what is most important is provided in Jesus. One of the articles that I read this week was titled, The Lord Will Provide, Why is God Called Jehovah Yireh in the Bible? by Barnabas Piper and Debbie McDaniel. And it said it like this. It said, on one side is God's provision of providing our daily needs. On the other side is God's provision of our rescue from sin. So the short term and the long term. I want to use that section, uh, section of the article to help us to get ready to share the grape juice. And then I'll say a prayer. We can pause the video and partake of that together and then go to our conclusion. So in the article it says, in Jesus' teachings we see one side of God's provision. In Jesus' mission on earth we see the other. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Jesus came so that we might have life and have it in abundance. John 10.10. 10. And this provision, this inestimable gift of his son, was more than kindness. It was a rescue, a ransom, a debt paid, a punishment born as a substitute for the guilty, a punishment for us. The same God who smiles on the brilliance of wildflowers and feeds a baby sparrow sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for sins already committed in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Jesus was the last and final sacrifice, the flawless lamb, able to redeem all sinners 
and pay for all sins for all time. Jesus is God's perfect and complete provision, the answer to every person's deepest question and the fulfillment of our deepest needs. In Genesis, Abraham was, Abraham's only son was to be sacrificed and was saved by God's miraculous provision. In the Gospels, God's only son was sacrificed as the miraculous provision for all people. When we say Jehovah Jireh, when we say the Lord will provide, we can be certain that it is true. We can see it in the flowers and the birds. We can see it on the cross. Jesus is our great provision. So as we get ready to share the grape juice, we can think of how Jesus provides for us. Let's go to God in prayer. Eternal and faithful God, we come to you again in thanks of who you are and how you reveal yourself to us. We are thankful for your provision, even in this time of isolation. Maybe we're more aware of what we really need and what is most important. And we are more focused on you and our time with you in eternity. We are thankful for Jesus providing for us every day and for providing us with the hope of heaven and the forgiveness of our sins. We share this grape juice thinking of the cost that Jesus paid and the suffering that he went through to restore the relationship that we broke with our sin and our selfishness. We are thankful for his blood on the cross, the blood that has washed away our sins, and the power in the blood that fills the church and empowers us to do your work. We come together today in worship of who you are and in amazement of how much you love us. We are thankful for being our provider, and we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is eternal and he is our provider. Our eternal God cares for us and he provides for us. These are helpful thoughts this week as we face the isolation that this pandemic has brought. We show our submission to our government and concern for others by staying at home as is possible as we encourage one another in different ways. So what do we do this week? Well, we don't have the same outlets that we used to, but this week let's commit to spending time in God's word and strengthening one another as we trust in God and the work of his kingdom until he comes. Think of it this way. May he find us ready and working with open hearts if he is sent to gather us this week. That is a possibility. It is always a possibility. May he find us working and ready with open hearts if he is sent to us this week. Thank you for being a blessing and have a wonderful week as we think of the blessing of being together, the blessing of being apart, and how we can use that to benefit others as we think of who God is and the opportunity to praise his name. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He is our everlasting God. He is the one who provide. He is our peace. He is the Lord of the army, and he is a jealous God. And that's where we'll end up next week. <laughs>